Sophie and I have something in common. Recently, we both got our first pair of glasses. But unlike me, Sophie has suffered deterioration of her eyesight way earlier than expected. Unwittingly, she's become part of an epidemic of short-sightedness in children worldwide. It's called myopia. And in education-intensive countries like China, the rise has been phenomenal. We can see that the prevalence of myopia in the Chinese population in uh, mid-70 or mid-60, it started from very low, like 20, 30%, but now it has increased to about 80% among the junior high school graduate. So four out of five people with myopia. At the largest eye center in China, corridors and waiting rooms are jammed with young myopic children waiting for eye exams. So the kids came in the summer school break, 100,000. This is a huge amount of number. In Europe and the US, rates have been steadily rising, and there's signs Australia is now following the trend. Hey, Sophie, come in. I've seen a, about a 30% rise in early myopia in younger kids coming into my practice. P. Certainly practitioners are reporting that, that they're seeing a lot more younger children becoming myopic. Although it sounds disturbing, the underlying cause may come as a surprise, with a bright and relatively simple solution. When you look at faraway objects, the lenses of your eyes bend parallel rays of light at an angle so that a sharp image is created on the back of your eye. To look at near objects, the internal lens needs to get rounder to bend the rays at a more acute angle. As you age, your lens loses flexibility and its ability to curve more. That's why reading gets harder and harder. But when you're myopic, it's the distance that becomes blurry. Is that blurry? Yes. The long-held view was that children like Sophie developed myopia due to their genetics. Z. It was in the family, in the parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, etc. Suddenly we're seeing a lot of non-genetic myopia. No one in Sophie's family has myopia. What is happening to you is as you're getting older, your eyeball is growing longer and your focus is getting shorter. It's a phenomenon happening to more and more children. The eyeballs grow abnormally into an elongated shape. It causes light rays from the distance to focus in front of the retina rather than on it, resulting in a blurred image. And there's nothing that the eye can do that'll clear that distance blur. Although Sophie's vision can be corrected with glasses, the younger you develop myopia, the more growing time is left in your eyes, and that can have serious consequences. Now we're seeing it in seven and eight-year-olds. The younger it starts, the higher it can go. There's now so many people growing short-sighted at a very young age that a frightening number of the world's population will be severely visually impaired into the future. So when we project it into the future, if we do nothing, by the year 2050, nearly half of the world's population will become myopic. It really depends on the development of the education system and other lifestyle changes. But the reality is there's an enormous amount of it. The first documented case of an extraordinary jump in the number of children suffering myopia was recorded in the Arctic. Here, Inuit populations have traditionally lived a life outdoors, hunting and fishing. But in the 1960s, compulsory schooling brought a dramatic change to their lifestyle. Inuit Eskimo families were being moved into settlements and being given rudimentary education, and all of a sudden myopia went through the roof. In just one generation, the prevalence of myopia jumped from less than 2% to almost 60%. Where the prevalence of myopia in a population is low, you are very likely to have a, a strong genetic link or familial link with myopia. 
where the population prevalence has gone up very rapidly, that means that the link between parental myopia and the children's myopia has dissipated. That's a good one. Okay, what else? Something in the environment is driving that level of myopia. If it were genetic, it couldn't change that fast. The question is, which environmental factors are the important ones? As with the Inuit populations, the rise in short-sightedness in China coincided with a change in schooling. After the disastrous Cultural Revolution, China rebuilt their education system and from the 1970s, academic competition intensified. Because before there's no university entry exam, so after 1976, everybody was pushing to study very hard. In China, Chinese parents 100% concerned on the education outcome. What we really believe is that schooling intensity or education system is really the key. Dramatic rises have also been seen in other education-intensive countries, such as Singapore, Taiwan and South Korea. The evidence both from the United States and from Europe is that it's increased. Probably in the United States, it's doubled in the last 30 years. Interestingly, Australia is something of an anomaly among developed countries. Despite our school kids being well educated, they've so far got off remarkably lightly. And ironically, that makes it a great place to study myopia. What's the big one in the middle? Very good. You know what, I'm going to go down again because I think you can see really, really well. We had a particular opportunity in Sydney where the rate of myopia is not particularly high to actually have a large enough group of children who weren't developing myopia and we could examine their behaviour and contrast it with those who were becoming myopic. Here in Australia, only about 30% of school leavers are myopic but the rate in selective schools is much higher, at around 50 or 60 per cent. Education was clearly a factor. There's a lot of evidence. But the thing that we thought might additionally be important was the amount of time that children spend outdoors. So we had that as a sort of, if you like, lurking hypothesis. To see if that hypothesis held ground, Ian and Catherine launched the Sydney Myopia Study. There were over 4,000 children and basically we went to 55 schools across the whole Sydney region recruiting children from year one and seven into the study. And I have to thank all the parents who did the Sydney Myopia study because we had a questionnaire that was 193 questions long. We asked about country of origin, we asked about lifestyle in terms of where they lived, but crucially we asked a lot of detail about how much time children were spending indoors versus outdoors and what kinds of activities they were doing. We were able to examine things like watching television using computers and that showed no correlation. As Ian and Catherine had predicted, the only protective habit seemed to be time outdoors. Any time spent outdoors, whether the child was being physically active or not active, was irrelevant in terms of providing the protective effect. In addition to that, we established that any indoor sport was not protective. So we were instantly able to exclude physical activity as one of the things that was influencing the uh, development of refractive error in children. The amount of near work children were doing also showed very little correlation. The conclusion we drew, and I think it's a very crucial conclusion to give to parents, is that children can do a lot of near work as long as they balance it with time outdoors. But the question is, why? There's a number of factors in being outside that could offer a protective effect. There's UV radiation, vitamin D from sunlight, and even the opportunity to stare into the distance. But animal studies show that it's the brightness of the light that makes all the difference. In Dr Regan Ashby's lab at the University of Canberra, baby roosters are being given different doses of bright light. 
to try to see how much is enough to prevent myopia and why. So this is essentially a daylight lamp. Precisely, so we're here trying to mimic what it would be like to be under intensities outside. So right now we're only at about 10,000 lux, so that's about what you'd see late in the evening. And then as we lower the lighting reef, obviously the intensity gets higher and higher. So the highest we can get is once we're on the cage, that's 40,000 lux, which is the equivalent to the light intensity you'd see on a winter's day or on a cloudy day in, in summer. And this little chicken, he's got a little goggle on. What's that for? So the goggles are there to induce abnormal growth in the eye so that we actually make them myopic. The goggle diffuses the light in one eye, making it want to grow to compensate for the blurriness. So essentially what you're doing is giving different doses of daylight and also making the eye want to be myopic. Precisely. And, and seeing if you can use light to stop that. Precisely. We give them the same amount of dosage each day. It's just the question of what intensity we give them. And at what point does that intensity override the want to become myopic? Regan's team use a special camera to measure refractive error in the chicken's eye to see whether they've developed myopia or not. An ultrasound probe while the chicken is asleep can also measure the depth of the eyeball to see how elongated it becomes, the true measure of myopic growth. So what we found was that the amount of myopia we can generate in chicken is proportional to the light intensity they're exposed to. When we got to 40,000 lux, we abolished the development of myopia in the chickens. Once they get to that three to five hour mark, that is enough per day of this high light to prevent myopia. 40,000 lux in Australia would be the equivalent of either a winter's day or a cloudy day. In Europe, that can actually be the intensity you see even in a summer's day. The reason bright light helps appears to be due to the way our eyes adjust to day and night. When you go out at night, you go to what's referred to as your rod vision, your black and white, your grainy scale vision. What it allows is that the eye takes as much possible light as possible and generates an image out of it. But by doing so, you lose that fine detail. During the day, cone cells in our eyes give us incredible detail, colour and high-definition images. To switch from our rod cells to our cone cells requires a neurotransmitter called retinal dopamine, the release of which is triggered by light. During the day, when you go out into the sunlight, what happens is dopamine levels go up, they turn off the rod pathway as such, and so what the dopamine system does is it stops the signal being diffuse anymore and it allows very fine tuning of the system, and that's what allows us to see fine detail. It's this release of dopamine that appears to be one of the key signals to stop eyes from elongating. When Regan injected chicks with a substance that blocked the effects of dopamine, they all developed myopia. Light had no effect whatsoever. We completely abolished any protection from the light itself. Although a well-lit room might feel nice and bright, the reality is it's very dim compared to daylight. A well-lit classroom is usually between around 500 to 1,000 lux, nowhere near bright enough to trigger the amount of dopamine needed. <laughs> what the eye needs is three hours a day at 40,000 lux. With all the evidence stacking up, Ian, Ming and Catherine launched an intervention trial in China to increase children's time outdoors. We did a big trial, a three-year trial, where 40 minutes a day was added to the school day by legislation. We were able to show that uh, we got about a 25% reduction in new cases of myopia, so we were stopping the children becoming myopic. Another trial in Taiwan, they were able to get 80 minutes a day and they got 50% protection. But only school intervention seems to be successful. We've tried to implement this at the level of families and homes and it's proven not to be uh, well received or taken up by parents. First of all, they don't understand why we have to bring the kids outside. And secondly, there's not much space. In China, all these major cities are very urbanised, so it's very hard to find a large green area for the children to play. Rural rates of myopia in China are around half those in urban areas. 
the urban city, everybody studied very hard. In the rural area, the schooling can be more relaxing and people pay around and also spend more time outdoors as well. To get kids even more daylight time at school, a glass classroom is currently being trialled in the Guangdong province. Instead of asking people to change behaviour, maybe we better change the classroom. So we develop a classroom, we call it sunlight classroom. So the classroom is transparent. It allows all this sunlight coming and then to increase the, the illumination to uh, 5,000 to 10,000 lux. Bright light may well prevent myopia, but what about those kids like Sophie who already have it? So far, there's limited evidence in humans that light can slow down the progression. So here at the Brian Holden Vision Institute, their main focus is developing optical products to help slow the progression of myopia. Their contact lenses and spectacles are designed with different powers of focus across the lens to address the refractive error across the whole eye rather than just the central vision. And this helps stop the eye elongating. We are able to show in these trials that contact lenses can slow the progression of myopia by anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. Even if you're able to control the progression of myopia by anything from 20 to 40 percent, you're going to make a substantial impact. But despite the current lack of evidence, it's very likely bright light will also be proven to slow the progression of myopia in children, as it does in chickens. I would find it very hard to hypothesise a biological mechanism that just worked to prevent the development of myopia but had nothing to do with its progression because the mechanism is exactly the same. And being afraid of sun damage is no reason not to give your children outdoor exposure. If you wear sunglasses, it actually stops the UV radi radiation but doesn't block the light enough to actually reduce the preventive effect of spending time outdoors. So children wearing hats, children wearing sunglasses is perfectly fine, but they'll still be getting enough light into their eyes because of the huge difference between indoor and outdoor lighting.